So we're going to uh, keep on and uh, switch, go to the next talk. And so Dr. Davar, a uh, member of the program, is going to talk about the microbiome intervention in cancer immunotherapy. Yeah, Karen, it's up to you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so thank you all for the opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing here. So I, I just want to highlight that the microbiome efforts at the University of Pittsburgh are definitely front and center. Uh, this work is actually being co-led uh, by many people uh, within the program, particularly uh, the co-leader of the program, Dr. Zoro, from whom you just heard, as well as myself. And we've got a very interesting set of interventions and uh, 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 that are potentially uh, you'll hear a little bit about today. So these are my disclosures. So, uh, you know, immune therapy uh, is really transformed the life of patients with melanoma. And you just heard, for example, with Nivorella, and also the biggest, the really two big news, is, uh, news in the last couple of months is the role of uh, adjuvant, uh, uh, the expansion of adjuvant check, uh, checkpoint in the adjuvant setting to stage high risk, no negative stage two disease, which is stage two B and C. But basically the point is that about 70% of our melanoma patients, so 70% of 100,000 people in the United States have access to checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy, no matter where you are in your life cycle, whether it's stage two B, C, stage three, stage four, and what we do know about these patients is that uh, one of the really important aspects is that the intestinal microbiome or the gut microbiota that you have in the 20 uh, feet of uh, bowel uh, all the way from the distal uh, uh, small bowel all the way until the stomach, uh, all the way until the rectum actually affects the likelihood of response to checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. So the, the data behind this actually comes from several different groups. You can see here uh, on the left data from uh, data from MD Anderson in the middle data from Chicago and on the right data from uh, France uh, showing all kinds of different organisms being, effect, uh, being associated with differential response to checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. But the key point is the organisms are very different. And why is that? So in order to answer this question, we actually did uh, a large study uh, that I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. But the, uh, this, this idea that there's a huge difference in, orga in organisms between people who do uh, better and compared to people who do poorly was actually highlighted in this meta-analysis as well, where you can see that uh, across all these different studies, uh, the studies are listed in the horizontal lines and the organisms are listed in the vertical columns. There is really very little concordance between what's good and what's bad. In fact, you see, for example, Fecalibacterium prausnitzii, three studies found that it's you know, kind of favorably associated and three studies found that it's unfavorably associated. So the real question is, why is this happening? And so in order to understand this, what we did was we did a very deep dive into this and this data has now been published. And the first thing and the most important thing that we identified was that uh, it's very clear that the gut microbiome separates people who do well and don't do well. Now, it's very interesting that it appears to do so at least at a very particular time point. And in the context of patients with advanced cancer who are receiving checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy, so this is nivolumab or pembrolizumab, the time point in which this appears to be important is about nine to 10 months. That means after about six months and definitely before one year, but closer to one year than six months. And it's around about the time point in which the vast majority of people who are failing immunotherapy actually appear to fail immunotherapy. We can identify that a vast majority of these organisms that appear to be favorably or unfavorably associated, favorable in blue and unfavorably in red, that were identified by other studies were actually picked up by our data as well. What this suggests is very importantly, part of the reason why there were very many differences between the patients uh, across these previously reported studies really has to do with how people define what was good and what was bad. So if you define what's good and what's bad based on you know, an arbitrary definition of cancer shrinkage or cancer growth, you don't necessarily pick up all the organisms that are associated with good and all the organisms that are associated with badness. Uh, more importantly, if you define what is good and what is bad in terms of landmark survival, that is likelihood of response at a certain time point uh, or non-growth of cancer at a certain time point, you identify all these organisms and you have a nice unifying hypothesis. Separately, it is also important to keep in mind that function is more important than form. And what that suggests, or that means is that when we've looked at the genes that these organisms carry, the vast majority of the organisms that appear to be beneficial have very, very similar genetic compositions, suggesting that even if organisms may appear to differ across different cohorts separated by geography, they may actually uh, mean the same thing as long as the genetic elements are the same, suggesting that before you talk about what organism is good and what organism is bad, you need to know whether or not 
the genes that, that organisms carry are favorably or unfavorably associated with checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. Now, separately in the same work, we also identified that the bugs that one carries is also associated with side effects, immune therapy related side effects. You can see here that patients with side effects are very different metagenomes, meaning their organisms are very, very differentially distributed. And the likelihood of at least one particular organism causing a variety of different side effects is very differentially distributed, in this case, streptococcus. And indeed, streptococcus, which is not a commensal that is normally found in the gut, when we wondered why it was being found in the gut, we hypothesized that the only reason why streptococcus, which is found in the mouth, can go to the gut is possibly because you're taking something, a patient is taking something that somehow artificially raises the gastric pH, raises the level of acidity in the stomach that is normally supposed to be present to prevent these bugs from going to the gut. And indeed, when we found that, we found that actually high levels of strep was associated with checkpoint uh, inhibitor patients who are receiving uh, proton pump inhibitors. And previous studies have looked, you know, have, have said that side effects are largely speaking favorably associated with uh, survival uh, differences in patients with checkpoint inhibitor uh, treatment. But some side effects, uh, some other studies suggested that this wasn't the case. And when we did this analysis all over again, we found that this analysis was largely, difference in the analysis was largely associated with the presence of this adverse species streptococcus. So the point is, organisms are associated with favorable as well as unfavorable outcomes of checkpoint and immunotherapy. But also very interestingly, organisms are also associated with the development or non-development of side effects. Now in that context, what we've separately tried to do, and uh, some of you on the call have actually participated in these clinical trials, we've actually sought to intervene with an intervention in patients who have uh, non-responsive checkpoint inhib inhibitor immunotherapy to see whether by changing the gut microbiome, whether we can elucidate response. And so in this kind of really proof of concept clinical trial that was done about three years ago, we gave people a single fecal transplant derived from a responder to patients who were not responding to checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. And we kept them going on the pembrolizumab that they were otherwise getting after an extensive series of serological matching between recipients and donors. And what we found was that about 15 patients who were treated, six out of the 15 patients had some kind of radiographic stabilization of disease. So the cancer either stopped growing or the cancer shrank. And these responses were long lived. And uh, many of these patients actually are still being followed uh, either with stable disease or response. Some of actually have stopped treatment and are just being followed. And what this tells us is that provocatively, a single fecal transplant designed to change the gut microbiome can actually produce responses in patients who are otherwise completely resistant to immune therapy. So it's a very provocative idea and it's something that is now undergoing further testing. Finally, some important translational questions to think about, and uh, that is, can this work in other cancers? Now to test the hypothesis in both melanoma as well as in other cancers, we are now embarking on the next generation of clinical trials. And the next generation of clinical trials focuses on one, in non-small cell lung cancer, you know, if checkpoint inhibitor therapy is great in melanoma, it's equally provocatively important in non-melanoma uh, cancers, including lung cancer, which affects three times as many people as melanoma. So let's try and see whether we can help lung cancer patients. And so in order to test that, we've developed a trial. We've gotten some funding from the NCI in the form of a large U01, which uh, Dr. Zoror is the PI of, as well as a separate foundation grant from Gateway that I'm the PI of. And we've now got a new study in which we're going to do this in non-small cell lung cancer. But also we've got another study in which we're gonna test this out in melanoma patients, building upon our earlier observations of checkpoint inhibitor therapy primary response being fixed by uh, a fecal microbiome intervention, what we're going to do is we're going to do this in combination with pembrolizumab and lenvatinib. So in melanoma patients, this combination of pembrolizumab and lenvatinib uh, is a, a combination that is currently undergoing uh, registration in 10 trials in both the relapse refractory setting as well as the frontline setting. Uh, the data is not out yet, but we're going to be giving patients with refractory melanoma access to a clinical trial in which patients are going to be randomized to either this combination, pembrolenva, or pembrolenva plus a microbiome intervention to try to see whether we can even improve upon the likelihood of response that we saw earlier. Secondarily, if side effects 
are related to the microbiome. What we know is we have this operating model in which we have side effects that happen in T cell rich organs and side effects that happen in T cell poor organs. So for example, there are sterile organs uh, such as the pancreas, the brain, the heart, which are not normally colonized by bacteria. And what we hypothesize is that the microbiome plays a critical role in determining the side effects in barrier or T cell rich organs, particularly the lung, the colon, the skin, potentially the liver. And it suggests that there is a key role played by the gut microbiome as shown in some of the earlier slides in the development of the side effect. And if that is the case, and if people are developing side effects because they may have, for example, an altered gut microbiome, that stands to reason that we can alter that for therapeutic benefits. So we actually have developed a trial in which we are going to be giving patients this. And there is good, some, there's good proof of concept data for this. So in an in a early study, investigators at MD Anderson gave fecal uh, transplants of healthy donors to patients with highly refractory side effects, uh, in particular colitis. So steroid refractory as well as biologic betalizumab and fliximab refractory colitis, a single fecal transplant, and they found that that made the symptoms better. So what we've done is we've gone to the next step. Instead of just treating two people, we want to treat a, a large national trial, potentially change the way people are going to be uh, being treated with checkpoint inhibitor colitis. And in this intervention, people are going to be getting a healthy donor fecal transplant in a formal study in which uh, that is going to be accruing nationally. And so, so this is EAZ211, a national trial in which patients with checkpoint inhibitor refractory colitis that have failed all standard treatments will be getting a microbiome intervention. In the second phase of the study, if the early phase is uh, provoked or meets some pre-specified boundaries of success, we'll be comparing uh, the fecal transplant intervention to actually biologics. So the whole goal eventually of changing the way side effects are treated. Finally, what do we know about this? Uh, so as, as, as discussed in checkpoint and a bit of patients, it's clear that the microbiome is very important. It clearly mediates the likelihood of developing response. Uh, and we know that in the context of patients who are treated with monotherapy, PD-1, a third to half of patients fail in the first six to 12 months. And that's exactly when the microbiome might be most important, suggesting that when you have good bugs, the good bugs help the other factors that are important for the immune system to respond to checkpoint and a bit immunotherapy to respond. And if you don't have those good bugs, while sometimes things work, sometimes they don't work and an intervention might actually be beneficial. And as we've shown here, the intervention is beneficial. And there's parallel data from a separate group in Israel that showed something similar as well, suggesting that when you give somebody a transplant, you basically restore the balance that is needed to allow the body to respond to immunotherapy, that it's trying to do so, but it's prevented from doing so when people have adversarial bugs. There's clear uh, data that you know, we need to try to do more studies. Uh, some companies have tried to develop specific consortium of bugs to try to essentially move this along and get a commercial pill. Uh, I will warn people that you know, there's very limited overlap between the organisms that have been identified in the studies that us and other people have done, one, and two, between these microbiome-specific consortia that are being developed by commercial companies suggesting that you know, we have to learn to walk before we can run. It might mean that at least in the near term, we need you know, fecal transplant-based interventions, but we will get there. Eventually we'll get to consortium, but the consortium might need further refinement. And so finally, we also know that you know, we want to do more in just melanoma. And so there's very good data that this is gonna work in non, uh, very promising data that this might be important in non-small cell lung cancer as well. And so we've got studies that are gonna test that. And finally, we know how important side effects are. We are now curing cancer with advanced immunotherapy. Uh, we cure about a third of our patients with advanced melanoma with the first instance, and we now have relapse refractory interventions that are helping even patients with a disease that is no longer responsive to frontline immunotherapy. However, these patients develop side effects. And as we move the drug earlier into lines of therapy with treating patients in the preventative setting, patients with high-risk node negative melanoma, uh, with pembrolizumab's recent approval, more people are getting the drug and more people are going to get side effects. And as more people get side effects, the burden upon patients, upon systems, upon families is going to increase. And so what we now realize is that along with treating cancer, we need to focus our attention on treating cancer-associated side effects and mitigating the burden of cancer and side effects upon patients. And so we now have new microbiome interventions to treat these side effects. Uh, so what you can do as individuals, one, keep in mind that they are interventions. So if you have a side effect or if you have refractory cancer, we have studies for you. We also have studies for side effects. And these studies 
but side effects will soon be available. And it's any cancer and any checkpoint inhibitor can enroll in these studies. Some people always ask about fiber, uh, about dietary interventions. I will warn people that dietary fads are, you know, the norm. You know, I have tried all kinds of different diets. Uh, there is some very provocative data uh, recently published that ketogenic diets and high fiber diets might be helpful. I will caution people that the same people that talked about high fiber being beneficial also suggested that probiotics were not so beneficial. So keep in mind, you know, uh, before you start any kind of dietary intervention, please talk to your doctor. And there is this uh, recent data from the MD Anderson group that was recently published in a good journal that high fiber was beneficial and high fiber is 20 grams a day. So for anybody who's wondering what 20 grams a day of fiber is, it's two medium artichokes, four cups of broccoli or five cups of Brussels sprout. So again, it's no slouch. Two cup, two artichokes, four cups of broccoli or five cups of Brussels sprouts, uncooked. Now, uh, you, the other thing that you guys can help us with is we would love to study this more. So we are already having a microbiome sampling effort. We will help you analyze this at no cost. We'll pay for it. We will also analyze your dietary intake. So if you want to know whether or not your fiber intake is high, we have a research coordinator asking you these questions and we will provide the analytic uh, data to you for your own uh, uh, review purposes if you're so interested. And this study is open to, again, any checkpoint inhibitor treated patient at the Hillman Cancer Center no matter where you are, who you are, who you're seeing, at any point in time, we can help you with this. So again, thank you for the opportunity to present and I'll stop and take any questions if there are any. Okay, I think uh, uh, we are done for with the microbiome intervention and uh, thank you so much, uh, Divakar.